Angel has judged over 35 mooting competitions, both at the national and international level, Stetson and Jessup, to name a few. Pranjal has been invited to quite a few universities, both in India and abroad, to deliver talks on the art of mooting, demystifying LLM applications, CM, uh, CV training, securing internships, etc. Before we start, sir, I would just like to thank you for taking out some time for this webinar. Uh, thank you, Palak. Thank you for the generous introduction. Very thank you, sir. I paid a lot of money to talk good things about me. I thank you. So, uh, can you please introduce the students to the type of work you do and how exactly that was planned? Are we talking about LLM wizards? What kind of things we do at LLM wizards? Is that what we're talking about? Uh, uh, indeed, sir, you can, can tell about that. Great. So, uh, like, like Palak mentioned, I'm a corporate lawyer. That's, that's basically my full-time job. And LLM Wizards happens to be a side hustle, which is basically an organization run by professional lawyers who have either received offer from training contracts, sorry, who have either received offer from Ivy League universities or are currently doing their LLM from Ivy League universities, including myself. So I did my LLM back in 2018. And then basically we sort of provide consultancy services where we assist all the students as well as professionals in their master's application right from the CV, the SOPs and the LORs. So that's that's the kind of things that we do. That's great, sir. So uh, what has motivated you personally to opt for an LLM from a foreign university? If you'd like to just share your plans with us today. Well, that's a, that's a tricky question, quite frankly, because uh, when I was at my law school, I was not very sure if I wanted to continue being a lawyer or if I wanted to switch and be a manager. So when I was applying, I was also applying for MIM. That is basically MBA for fresh graduates. It's called as Masters in Management. And then I got offers from a couple of universities, a couple of business schools in Europe, and also from a couple of law schools across the globe. But then I decided that since I've spent so much time studying law, might as well specialize in this area, that is one. But my primary motivation, quite frankly, was to travel and to sort of be abroad for a year and just experience what life feels like when you are in Europe. So that was my primary motivation, but it could genuinely be different for anybody else. There are people, I had colleagues who were genuinely interested in gaining a specialization in the subject that they really liked. There were people like me who just wanted to take a break from their work and they came there for a year. So you'll find all sorts of people with all sorts of, with variety and diversified motivation. My motivation was just to have a one year long vacation and I think I, I did a right, I, I personally feel that it was the right thing to do and I am quite, quite happy with my decision. That's, that's great to hear, sir. So would you please elaborate on the career trajectory or career progression for someone who is planning to do an LLM? Uh, sure. So basically, uh, you could decide that you want to be a master's either when you are in your fourth year or when you're in a final year. And you decide that you want to do your master's immediately after your law school, just like I did. Or you could probably want to work for a couple of years, maybe gain some, some sort of professional experience and then go for your master's. So uh, it, it would really depend what you want and what is your motivation behind it. But career trajectory would be quite simple and it could be very complex. So depending upon what you want to do, let's say, for example, there are people who studied international law or international human rights in their LLM. And they ended up working at World Bank and organizations affiliated to World Bank or United Nations. So it, you don't really know where it's going to take you. A lot of people come back and they, they start litigating. A lot of people join law firms. A lot of people join niche practice areas like they specialize in international law. So there are law firms across the globe which specialize in international law. This is just an example. So basically, it would depend on what, how, how you are actually viewing your LLM. Do you want to come back? Do you, do you plan to come back or do you plan to settle down? Then the kind of things that you will have to do while you're doing your master's will, will sort of actually vary a lot. So depending upon where you see yourself after your master's, the kind of choices you will make will definitely make a difference. And a lot of people who are specializing, let's say in corporate law, they don't really get internships with law firms abroad. So they come back and they end up joining a transactional law firm here. A lot of people who specialize in international law, they find internships in international organizations, like I mentioned, maybe UN, World Bank, and things like that, IMF. They intern with them 
for maybe a few months and then they decide that whether they want to continue their full time or whether they want to come back and do something else so uh the trajectory per se would be very very personalized and would be very diversified depending depending upon the kind of specialization that you opt for and the kind of university you end up going to because these opportunities would be very would be different for different parts of the world indeed sir so uh if if we if we have to compare the universities in india and abroad for masters what would you suggest and why all right so this is this is rather a difficult question and you have put me in a spot no offense to anybody who is doing their masters in india i i mean i think it's even in indian even indian law schools have tried genuinely their best to actually match up to their standards it's a long way to go a lot of grass needs to be covered but i wouldn't say that we are far behind so uh in terms of utility unfortunately the industry doesn't really perceive a lot of value in the indian llm so even if you do your llm from let's say nls bangalore or nlu delhi or whichever law school may be general for that matter whichever law school you can think of uh the job prospects after your master especially if we talk about the commercial or specialization or if you intend to work in a law firm the, does not really alter unfortunately but that may not be the case when you have done a foreign llm because it's taken slightly more seriously that does not mean that all gates would open immediately once you come back from whichever country you went to for your masters but it's a relatively easier battle and you have a you have better opportunities and people tend to take you more seriously for whatever reason maybe for all the wrong reasons but that's how the industry is so i wouldn't really give you a very grim a very happy picture where it does not really matter if you do it from india or if you do it abroad now the, there are a couple of differences that would come up first of all financing it's a very expensive affair whatever you study not just an llm but especially law school law school in india is very expensive so sorry law school abroad is very expensive so basically you will have to you will have to decide if you are in a position to actually sponsor your education if you're getting good scholarships if that is the case then yes you should definitely go abroad because it's the kind of exposure that you get over there you probably may not end up getting here that is one secondly the pedagogic techniques they have genuinely taken education to another level and the kind of things that we study here and the, and the way they study there it's very very different so the kind of values that we attach here it's not really the same over there in almost all the cases in almost all the specialization the idea is not to test your memory which inadvertently happens to be the case in india unfortunately the idea is to test test your understanding so that is a primary difference and that's that's where the whole difference in technique teaching techniques come into play so when when you actually do your masters from abroad from a good university you realize how different it is the culture the teaching culture i'm not even talking about your colleagues your batchmates or peers your seniors just talking about strictly from the perspective of how they're going to teach you so the idea is since they know that ultimately they want to test how much you have understood and if you are actually able to apply whatever you have understood if that's the idea then the, the way they teach it's very very different so i think it's a different ball game and they are playing on a very different level and we are yet to be there it's going to take some time for sure indeed sir so uh, what can a law student do to structure his her their profile for abroad studies sorry i i didn't catch the question could you please repeat uh, sir uh, my question to you was that what can a law student do to structure their profile in order to study abroad ha uh, well there is no uh, right or wrong answer to this question probably multiple wrong answers but no right answer every person brings a different perspective different things into to the table so you have to understand as to what are you bringing to the table and then you play your strength so that's the idea basically you identify that these are the kind of things that you have done in your law school you have probably done pretty much everything that a law school has to offer and then these are your primary strengths and then you play those strengths so uh the short answer would be let's say you probably you build your profile first of all academics would be very very important if you are aiming for a top top tier uk university any any good uk university for that matter but if we come to tier 2 universities and academics probably is not that relevant and then even if you are not let's say in the top 10 or top 20% of your batch you still have a fair shot 
for US universities, for US law schools, you need to have work ex of at least two years if you're talking about the Ivy League universities, including Stanford, because Stanford does not happen to be an Ivy League university. So basically all these good top-notch universities in US expect you to have at least two years of professional work experience, which is only counted after you have qualified. So after you, after you are done with your law school, that's when they start counting. So even if you have two or three years of internship experience or articling experience, that wouldn't really matter to them because your post-qualification experience is what matters. So if you are aiming for a US law school, I would really recommend that you wait for at least one, one and a half years, gain some sort of relevant experience, and then you apply. For UK law school, you can directly apply while you're in your final year, and then you decide the kind of things that you have to work upon. Firstly, you need to sort of reflect your commitment towards the subject. That is the most important thing. How do you do that? Let's say, for example, if I say that I'm interested in human rights law, or let's, let's take my example. I say that I'm interested in corporate law. How do I justify that interest? Firstly, I tell them that I've studied corporate law papers. That is one. And these are my grades in that. Then I say that I have done seven, eight corporate law internships. I've worked at multiple firms and I've worked in these, these, these practice areas. And these are the kind of things I have done to enhance my corporate law understanding. That's my practical experience. Thirdly, I tell them I have written a couple of corporate law related papers or maybe articles or blog posts. Then I say that I have done a couple of moots. So basically I have to make an argument that I'm genuinely interested in and I'm really committed to this field of law, whichever field I'm applying to. And accordingly, I make, I make an argument that this is why I am a right fit. I actually fit into this whole program and that's why you should take me. So no matter which field ultimately you decide to apply to, you have to show true commitment towards it and whatever ways you can reflect that, you have to use that. And it does not mean that you have to confine your experience just your law school, you could probably go back and say that these are kind of things that you did while you were in school. You use those things. So basically, whatever thing will help you to make an argument that you are interested or you are meant for this field, you use that. So it boils down to you have to ultimately play your strengths. So I'm not sure if she's still here. Did Palak get disconnected? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so I'll wait. Yes. I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any questions at this stage. So we haven't really touched anything, but if at this stage anyone has any questions, I'm happy to address them till the time we wait for Palak. Yes, so I've received a question. Is LLM useful in litigation? Quite frankly, there is no right or wrong answer to this. It really depends. A lot of people do their BCL from Oxford and then they come back and then they litigate. So A, if you do it from a good law school, when you start litigating, people will tend to take you more seriously. You'll have a better brand name than people who probably do not have that kind of experience, especially if you're working in a small small city, maybe not small city per se, but like in a, in a not a metropolitan city like Delhi or Bombay or Bangalore, and let's say you're working in some district court or in a high court in a, beyond these states or beyond these cities. So you have a you have a better shot of getting better clients because then you sort of leverage that LLM experience. And of course, initially when you come back, if you do not have work X, you'll have to work under a counselor, under a senior, and then you make your own name and then you use that LLM degree for your own benefit and seek clients. That's, that's the only advantage because they're not gonna teach you the skills that are relevant for litigation in your LLM. Not sure if I understood the question correctly, but I hope that answers the question. Okay, there are too many questions now. Uh, all right, sir. So I think we can continue with our webinar. Okay. So, yeah. So, uh, so further, it would be great if you could inform us about the scholarships or entrance exams, if any, which would help the students in this regard. So, uh, fortunately, and lucky for you guys, there are no scholar. There are no examination that you have to clear or there is no threshold for any examination that you have to cross in order for you to be eligible to apply for your LLM program. It's not a business school where you have to take, you have to mandatorily take GMAT or GRE 
you just apply there is a standard application for almost every university if it, there are there are variations of course depending upon which university you apply to but it's largely standard and the documents that you have to submit are also standard so there is just one examination that, that you will have to take which is which is a very easy examination so it's more of a test than an examination it's like it wherein you justify rather you prove your english proficiency so it's you either take ielts or you take toefl these are the two most popular english proficiency tests and you don't even have to take these examination before you apply once you apply if they make you an offer that offer will be conditional to you clearing that examination rather reaching a specified threshold and it's very very easy so so basically the short answer is no examination just that test that i was talking about secondly scholarship or uh, scholarship is a rather touchy topic for scholarships so uh, there are two kinds of scholarship actually a it's going to be an internal scholarship and b it's going to be an external scholarship internal scholarship would basically mean wherein the scholarships are being offered by the university where you end up applying so let's say if you are applying to university of cambridge then gates would be an internal scholarship which gates trust which is associated with cambridge offers if you are applying to oxford roads may be considered as an internal slash external scholarship because roads happens to be a different organization from oxford but roads is only offered if you have an offer or rather if you want to study from oxford so in that manner roads could be considered as an internal scholarship but there are external organization like for example there is organization called as chevening scholarship so these are external to the universities that you have to apply to and you have to make an independent application here whatever they require you answer those questions you submit your letter of recommendation and if they like you if they if they sort of find you desirable then they probably call you for an interview and then you are awarded something so for a couple of universities like let's say lsc nus lsc would be london school of economics nus would be national Uni university of singapore you get to submit a scholarship essay as part of your application process so apart from the statement of purpose you can also submit one page scholarship essay to these universities and if they find merit in that argument if they find if they find you meritorious they will on their own award you scholarships for universities like oxford and cambridge most of the scholarships are awarded automatically which essentially means that you don't really have to do anything apart from just submitting your application your application is circulated internally amongst variety of trust that these universities have established if any of if you sort of fulfill any of the criteria that these trusts have then they make you an offer not an offer then they make you an award so it really depends and when you are applying to universities you you should really check out what are the financial aid option and they like very proudly sort of uh rather they very proudly talk about these things on their websites and they say that these are the kind of offers that we have if you are eligible you should apply if there is no application then you are automatically considered but i must point out that it's not a very sunny picture out there and it's rather difficult to get scholarships and it's because it's not just based on merits like i said that there are certain criteria that the university has for example they want to make an award of let's say 1 million dollar in an accounting year to indian students assuming there is a university like oxford this is their quota if they have already made an offer to let's say five or six llm students then even if you are very deserving from somebody who's probably interested in pursuing engineering and has applied in the engineering school then they may consider him or her over you because they have already finished the quota that they have for law school so these are just internal quotas and internal rules that the university has when it when it's a fully fledged trust organization which are offering the scholarship but there are scholarships that are dedicated to a particular faculty faculty of law will have dedicated scholarships faculty of arts faculty of social sciences business etc etc so if you are able to qualify if you if you make a sound application then they are very happy to fund you but it's not that easy especially when you are aiming for tier one universities getting an offer from these universities is actually as good as getting a scholarship i hope i answered the question unless of course there are any follow up questions on that more than happy to take them yes sir absolutely sir so what would you suggest to the students who are planning to settle abroad considering the turbulent times that we are all living in currently nice nice interesting question but i don't think you should be worried about covid as such because a it's not going to be here forever 
and I suspect that most of the classes, at least in UK and US, would go back to normal by January 2022. So even if there are people here who want to apply this year, they'll be going next year and things will be pretty normal for them. So they would be experiencing the basic education which all of us received in the pre-COVID session. That is one. Now, settling down abroad is actually a diff different question altogether. Understand that law, unlike a business degree, is not something that sort of offers you jobs. It's not meant to cater to industry. It's actually meant for you to add value to yourself, to add value to your profession, to gain specialized knowledge in the field. So it's not like, it's not going to happen once you have done your LLM, you will magically be more marketable, you'll magically be more employable. The road's going to be slightly easier, but it's still going to be the same. So you'll have to apply, keep applying, you'll have to be okay with getting rejections. And then once something clicks, it clicks. But the, the idea is, the problem with settling abroad with an LLM degree, and understand that a lot of people have done that, and I could have also done that because I had a couple of offers, but the problem with us is there are jurisdictional barriers. We are professionals like doctors, so we have to qualify. We have to clear certain examination to be qualified lawyers in another country. So even if somebody is willing to take you, the qualification is a problem, that is one. Secondly, a bigger problem is visa sponsorship. There are people, even if you are absolutely stunning, you have done your LLM, you are a great candidate. Every law firm has a limited visa quotas that they can you know, sponsor and then it's an expensive affair. So when a law firm is taking you, it needs to be absolutely sure that for this job, there is nobody in the UK, let's say you are applying to UK law firm, nobody in the UK who can actually bring the perspective that you can. So if the law firm is not convinced on that, they will not make you an offer because it's a very, very expensive affair and they're going to spend like thousands of dollars on you and they would want you to stick around for at least five years if they're spending that much amount just on your visa sponsorship, right? So settling down is a slightly more nuanced than being able to do your LLM in the pre-COVID era, even if you apply this year. Right. It was really insightful, sir. Sir, so it is a general perception that people who possess a master's degree from foreign institutions are more likely to settle abroad. Please clarify if the same is a myth or a fact. No, no, it's, it's definitely a myth and it's not a fact. It's rather, it's an exception and not a norm. Majority of the students, for whatever reason, a lot of them want to come back, of course. I wouldn't say that there are people who sort of... I wouldn't say that people are not finding jobs, but the norm is 60 to 70% of people who are doing their masters from abroad, especially in this legal field, they have to come back either because they couldn't find a job or because they couldn't find an employer who would sponsor their visas or they couldn't really find a place where they could apply for whatever reason. So like I said, it's, it's not a norm wherein people who are doing their masters from XYZ country they end up settling there because there are multiple factors like I suggested and like I already pointed out. So most of us who go for their masters end up coming back and then they join. I mean, they basically then start working in their home jurisdiction. And it's not just in India. Majority of the people who come from variety of their country, variety of continents or countries, they all go back. Be it America, be it Colombia, whatever country you can think of, most of the people go back to their home country. Right, right. Thank you for answering the question, sir. So, so my next question is, what are the barriers or hurdles that a student generally comes across when he or she moves to a different country for an LLM? Sorry, is this question about what's going to happen when you are there or is this the question about what's going to happen when you want to be there? Like, are we talking about application stage or are we talking about admission stage? So the admission stage. Admission stage, okay. Well, from personal experience, if I talk about myself, the most, the most ridiculous thing that I faced was not being able to eat proper food. I used to be a vegan when I went for my master's and it was genuinely very, very difficult for me to adjust to the kind of food that the university had to offer. A, there are very limited choices in Europe and B, the food sucked. So that, that was, and probably a lot of people do not face this issue. And I 
the reason why I face this issue is because A, I also cannot cook. I struggled a lot. I tried, but then I failed visibly. So people will have different problems over there and a lot of people, but I think the biggest problem that anybody would face would be finding friends, finding people who you can chill with, who, who form part of your rich social circle life. And that's why those people end up getting depressed in their master's time. You know, they don't really enjoy their master's or they end up coming back to India whenever they get an opportunity or whenever there is a vacation. But I think everybody tends to enjoy their limited time that they have when they are abroad. So I would, I, I would say it's very, very different for different people. But a lot of people also end up being homesick and then they decide to just come back and then whenever there is an opportunity. So it's quite different for different people, I would say. But no such red flags, I, that is something that I, there are no red flags that I think I can point out at this stage. Right. I think even I am a part of it. I I am very scared of hostels and everything, bad food. So yeah, I can definitely relate to you. So yeah, moving forward, are there any books or peer-reviewed articles that you would like to suggest to someone who has just started in this field? As in who has joined law school? Not just law school, basically who is preparing to go outside for an LLM. Okay. Well, First of all, all of you are welcome to take our services. That's that's a joke, of course. I'm not trying to advertise her. But there are no such books and there is no there is no recipe that you have to follow. You just have to be honest to yourself. You just have to make a convincing application. You have to submit all the documents that you are required to. And then you are golden and then you just hope for the best. So there is nothing extra that you have to do apart from submitting all the documents that you are expected to do. There is no additional preparation or there is no additional reading as such. When, of course, let's say you are doing a financial course, if you, let's say, apply to uh, MLF, which is offered by Oxford MSc in Law and Finance, then they would expect you to have some, some elementary knowledge of stats and maybe financial economics. So they'll ask you once they make you an offer, of course, that is also once they make you an offer, they'll ask you to read upon a couple of things before you actually start your studies for the master's. That's only for them to ensure that you do not really lag behind once the course or once the session starts, because a lot of people who would be studying that course would, ha would have some sort of financial background and would have a fair bit of understanding of the way financial markets, financial economics work. But apart from that, there is no additional reading or there is no prerequisite preparation that you have to do before you submit your application or before you shoot your application. Right, got it, sir. Sir, so if you could uh, give one tip to our students here today, uh, what could it be? I know giving one tip is really difficult, but yeah. <laughs> well, one honest tip would be if you think that you can actually say when you are drunk, please don't because you cannot. So it's it's a very it's a skill that will take you a long, long way. But on a serious note, I, I think that there are a couple of burdens that you have to discharge in your application. And a lot of us are not able to discharge those burdens. The most important burden when you are submitting an application and consider this as my tip for that matter. It's like you have to make an argument that this is where you stand today from your SOP. So you tell them about your background. You say that these are the kind of things that you've done. This was your motivation of studying law. So you say that this is where you stand today. Then you say that this is where you aspire to be tomorrow because in your SOP, you have to talk about your career goals as well, right? And then you say that an LLM, an LLM from this university is the only way that will bridge the gap between where I stand today and where I aspire to be tomorrow. If you are able to discharge this limited burden that this is the only way this university and this LLM, which is offered by this university, is the only way that will, that I, that will help me rather enable me or push me towards or achieve my career goal, then you are almost golden. So that you, whenever you are reviewing your SOP, once it's finalized, once you have a first draft, you have to find out whether you are able to discharge this burden or not, whether you are able to make this argument or not. Right, sir. So. Sir, so, so the questions from my end are over, but we have a lot of questions from the audience. Uh, so, so the first question I can see is, um, you said LLM is from abroad is very expensive. How expensive are we talking about? Okay. So it would honestly depend. First of all, uh, Education in US is more expensive than any education in UK. Oh, apologies, okay. sir. I, I got disconnected. So that is why Lippy had to take over. There were some issues with my internet. I have joined again. 
no 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 and all and also sorry for interrupting if i have no no it's okay it's, it's absolutely fine should i should i continue should i address the question yeah yeah definitely sir so uh education in us relatively be it your lm or your business degree or your medicine is much more expensive than education in uk that is one so let's say if we compare harvard and oxford or harvard and cambridge cambridge tuition fee just tuition we are not talking about the entire stay and what's going to what it's going to cost you in total but cambridge tuition fee or for your llm or the mcl the course that i did was 30000 pounds which should come down to around 31 lakhs right now probably 31 lakh or 32 lakhs because the exchange rate has sky skyed high right now llm from harvard would cost you over 80000 dollars so that is probably that will come down to over 56 or 57 lakhs at least so basically if you talk about an llm from either Ox either uk or us the minimum that is going to cost you would be between 25 to 35 lakh that is in uk and in us the minimum it will cost you the bottom line the lower limit would be around i think 45 lakhs that's the tuition fee if you get scholarships that is great otherwise you'll have to sort of take education no one or you'll have to crowd fund you'll have to sort of just figure out way to fund your education now staying and cost of living and everything else would be another 10 to 15 lakh depending upon how you end up staying what is your lifestyle how you eating if you are traveling if you are going out drinking so everything cost a lot of money right so basically i think the total expenditure that you should budget for your llm should be between 40 to 45 lakhs so that's that's the total cost i would i would think yeah right so 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 the next question that we have is uh i don't have much moots to my credit but have publications in the relevant field will that affect my admission i will be completing my third year what else should i do to cover this demerit okay uh no offense memo pandits and i'm not trying to steal your business that's not the idea but moots may not be that relevant when you are applying to all these tier 1 universities moots are probably of course you will use them when you have done a lot of moots you use them and say that you are a great lawyer you not only do you understand theory but you also understand how to apply these legal applications and everything else but moots may not moots may only go to a certain extent when you are sort of talking about your qualification so there were people in my batch who were international mooters who had won like international moots multiple international moots and there were people in my batch who hadn't done a single moot in their life so it would really depend as to if like i said if you do not have moots you don't talk about it you don't worry about it you talk about your publications because that is your usp so always play your strengths you don't even have a section in your cv that says mooting or basically try to try to frame your cv in such a manner that it feels that nothing it's not incomplete so if you are able to fill that gap very very cautiously and very smartly there is no problem and of course if you like mooting then you should really moot because it's very very satisfying that is one so always know that the philosophy that i had while i was in law school was i only did the things that i liked so i did like couple of moots when i was in law school i did like loads of debates when i was in law school i did not have a single research paper when i was in law school because i didn't really enjoy writing so you always know that okay these are the kind of things that you bring to the table and these are the kind of things that you have done in your law school so you talk about those things very very smartly and you make a very good story and you sort of put a convincing argument that okay this is me so you don't have to worry about the things that you do not have and let's say if you talk about how you build your profile at this stage i think some sort of volunteering experience would be a good way to start holding some sort of, some some kind of position of responsibility because they really dig into your leadership skills so if you are able to justify that then it, then it's a great great story i think right i think i am saved here like personally sir am i audible
am i audible everyone uh, if you could please confirm in the chat box all right all right thank you thank you i think sir's internet is giving a little problem we'll wait for him for a while hello yes sir hi sorry i got disconnected i'm not sure what happened it's completely fine sir was so, i able to address the question yes sir yes okay great. so so i'm moving forward with the next question um so i am mainly aiming for judiciary but there is still a question that whether llm is very important or whether i should continue with my judiciary preparation just want your suggestion as everyone has their own point of views regarding the same and my main focus and interest area is really towards judiciary so can you please suggest something yes of course of course firstly focus on judiciary and secondly the good thing about judiciary is once once you have worked for a couple of years as a judge the government will very happily sponsor your master's education so let the government pay for your For your masters, and why do you want to spend money? If you think that you will end up clearing the examination, and since that's the primary focus, you should really prepare for it, and then do your mark. Do then do clear the examination, clear the interview, become a judge, work as a judge for a couple of years, then let the government pay for your masters. So I think the short answer is focus on judiciary right now, and then you should decide whether you still want to do your LLM afterwards or not. Right. So so do we need to take LSAT for LLM? not for llm if you want to do your jd from us or your jd from australia then you have to do lsat otherwise you don't all right so the next question is what are the job prospects at law firms in jurisdictions like us and uk and perhaps even india considering higher perceived value as you mentioned post an llm so uh us much like india there are law firms actually go to the us law schools and they interview you and then they offer you jobs the only problem is the visa requirement so even if a law firm in us is willing to sponsor your visa the way it works out is at the end of the day h1b is lottery based so if your name does not come out in that lottery if you are unlucky then you have to come back so uh it's easy the finding a job in us as compared to uk but then finding that visa is much more technical and much more nuanced than it is in uk now in uk you have to apply there is a single window application process which basically means that everybody and anyone under the sun is eligible to apply they may or may not consider you of course it's a different story but you don't really have an edge even if you're studying from even if you're studying at oxford or cambridge law firms wouldn't really come to your university and recruit you basically recruit you through inter interviews but that wouldn't really be the case in us because law firms would actually come to your law school they'll take interviews and then they'll shortlist candidates and offer them jobs so here even if you are studying from a tier 3 university in uk you can still apply that is one i mean you can still apply through the portal and even if you are studying in tier 1 university you'll have to apply so i hope you you are able to get the distinction that i am trying to make here now in uk finding a job is more difficult than actually finding that visa requirement of visa sponsorship because once a law firm likes you they will very happily sponsor your visa and once they sponsor your visa there is no problem because there is no concept or there is no yeah there is no concept of lottery system once the law firm sponsors your visa 
you get a visa it's as simple as that right so you in uk you struggle in finding a job and in us you struggle with finding the visas so that's the only difference but in terms of difficulty like i said if you let's say uk would allow you yeah this is actually an interesting point to do your masters from uk uk would allow you to be in the country for two more years so even if you are not able to find a legal job if you can find a non legal job you at least get to be in the country for two more years make some money decide whether you want to continue with the job that you are doing in the non legal field and then probably you start off with an internship and then convert it into a full time position or you want to come back and start being a lawyer again so that's a practical call that you will have to make this relaxation of 1 plus 2 would not really exist in us so basically once your visa term ends before that you'll have to find a job and then consequently the law firm will apply for your visa you'll get an extension if you find a job of course for a particular period of time and then when the lottery comes out if your name is there you're great it's lucky if you're not it's just sad and unlucky unfortunately then you'll have to come back right uh so so the next question is how do we choose the universities to submit our applications would it be better our chances to apply for many university or should we apply to just a selected universities so i always recommend my clients to not apply to more than 7 or 8 universities because that's a lot and of course i understand that at the end of the day it's a numbers game because it's the more number of universities you apply to the better shot you have of getting offers from a couple of universities but ultimately you have to do to do justice with your application and you have to genuinely tell them that you are really committed to this field to this university so this is the this is the argument that you have to make like i said right so uh i think any anywhere between 7 to 9 university is a good figure you could of course decide upon a smaller figure you could probably just apply to five universities because even applications would cost you money especially us application even to us application it's not a direct process you apply through this mediatory called as lsac registration of lsac is going to co- will cost you around 18000 rupees that's just registration and then of course you'll have to pay more depending upon the application fee of the university that you choose to apply to so if you end up applying to five to six universities or seven universities you'll probably have to shell out 40 to 45k in just your application process right so that is one thing secondly a uh, shortlisting university i think it's a it's much like proposing to the girl or guy of your dreams this this is how i always perceive it once you basically why do you like a person you have certain criteria you have certain likings you have certain preferences and that person particularly fits into those preferences and that's how you end up liking that person and you don't really end up proposing everybody on the road right so you basically shortlist a couple of people maybe you come across them in your high school or in your law school and then you decide okay these are the kind of people that i can actually potentially date and then you end up asking out maybe two or three of them so much like that you sh- should just blatantly apply that analogy to universities and you say that okay these are the kind of places couple of people just don't like us maybe because of the weather or maybe because of the country or they feel that it's just too far whatever reason so this is how you shortlist you basically eliminate by selecting selection by elimination that's a very very smart way of doing it if you do not know what you like you start off by knowing what you do not like and what you dislike so if you are not fan of a particular country or a particular continent or a particular city you just strike that off completely let's say if you do if you think that okay i would rather go and study in europe because it's prettier then you have basically crossed all the other continents that are out there and now your primary focus is in europe so now you only find out the universities that exist in europe so this is one way of going about it then i would really really recommend and this is like my honest advice to not run after brands but run after the courses that the university has to offer it could very much happen that you end up receiving an offer from harvard but you really want to specialize in antitrust laws and then you realize that for antitrust or for competition there is probably just one module that harvard offers and everything else is basically surrounding it it's maybe commercial law business law etc etc and then there is another law school maybe not as reputed as harvard but like fairly reputed let's say kings college which offers a specialized program in competition law so i would suggest that you you should go to kings college and do that llm in competition law as opposed to choosing harvard just because it's a better brand so this is how you go about it that you find out the courses that is being offered in the university you see if it actually aligns perfectly with your interest area 
and then you make an application there right this is a very useful advice so uh, the next question is uh, there's a mindset in india that if you will pursue llm from <clears throat> indian universities you will end up doing teaching jobs in the law school is this a myth or a fact so basically what are the opportunities we'll be having after pursuing llm from india so uh, it's not a myth but it's also a myth so it's yes and no unfortunately like i said that the industry does see llm from india in very high regards so as a consequence even if let's say law firms are going to nls or law firms are going to all the other nlus and of course other private universities they are largely focusing on the llb people so they are largely focusing on the undergraduate crowd and that's where they do substantial amount of their hiring from all these people sorry all these people who are doing their masters from all these law schools they'll have to they have to curate their own ways apply independently of course that does not mean that people who are doing their llb do not have to apply independently but people who are doing llm from all these universities they have a slightly harder route because that's the path they have sort of chosen for themselves and it's much more difficult to find a job when you're doing an llm from india than if you were doing an llb so you still have a better shot for whatever reason because that's how the industry perceives it that is if you're talking about law firms if you're talking about policy think tanks it's not really going to make much of a difference because policy think tanks let's say vidhi vidhi is there then there is brookfields and there are multiple policy organizations so if you're interested in public policy and policy making or, or working in a think tank then lm from india will probably be considered as good as an lm from abroad so you wouldn't really be discriminated on that front that is another thing if you want to do teaching as well and if you are aiming for a good indian law school unfortunately especially now if that this was 10 year if we were having this conversation 20 or 15 years ago none of this would have mattered because llm in india people who did their llm from india were i mean basically could find jobs in indian universities as well very very easily so even now of course people are working in good law schools so a friend of mine is working in nadu jodhpur after doing his llm from india but it's still more much more difficult and it's not the route that everybody gets to be part of so while of course teaching is one obvious career move but that does not mean that you don't get to enter the law firm at all you may be start off with a tier 2 firm and then make your way into tier 1 if that's what if that's where you see yourself working at or you apply to other policy think tanks or you apply to government organizations because if you if you end up applying to government organizations there is no such discrimination and you will probably be preferred over an llb graduate if you are doing an llm from india that, that is yeah all right got it sir so so what are the main things which we need in our cv or application for llm in abroad firstly if you are aiming for a tier 1 university then your grades your academic standing that is one secondly relevant work experience pre qualified i'm not even talking about post qualified experience relevant work experience so if you are interested in applying to human rights law let's hope that you have some sort of experience in human rights so maybe some sort of engagement in human rights for that matter and then if you are applying for corporate law specialization then corporate law interns would really be helpful then thirdly some sort of volunteering experience maybe charity organization or association with an ngo or being part of your legal aid cell of your law school some sort of volunteering experience then holding position of responsibility because like i said leadership skills are very very important then of course mooting if you have done a couple of moots so that is another thing that you should do and i think everybody should experience that at least once or twice and then they decide whether they want to do it or not then of course research papers blog post articles so whatever suits you if you do not see yourself writing lengthy research papers of 7 8 pages maybe just write a small blog post to any of their online blogs then of course your extra curriculars will also uh, matter a lot let's say if you have done attended a couple of conferences be it in india or quickly end up in showing that you are somebody who has tried everything that law school had to offer and this is the decision that you have to make that, that you have decided for yourself and you have made for yourself so you have to tell them that you are somebody who has done everything and you are somebody who has genuinely tried to make his or her profile better 
so these are kind of things and this is i nothing extra apart from this and you don't have to go out of your way and maybe sort of you know raise million dollars to actually get into harvard or get an lor from a judge in order to get through these universities or crack the system you just have to make a consistent effort and you have to make an argument that you have done a lot of things in your law school and this is why you are a deserving candidate for this position all right so sir so i have heard workx matters much for llm and us can we apply for masters without even workx a uh, short answer no long answer yes but the chances are very grim so while you may decide to apply it's almost all these universities like for example harvard stanford yale chicago columbia they explicitly mention in their website that they prefer students who have at least 2 years of work ex so this is the requirement that they have set for themselves that does not mean that if you end up doing a llm from there you wouldn't really find any fresh graduates but let's say if there is a class of 180 people probably five or six of them are freshers and then everyone else is somebody who has some sort of work ex in europe there is not a culture of actually working before you do your masters so you will find a lot of europeans who would come straight out of law school and have attended all these fancy ivy league universities so that's the exception that the carve out that these us law schools have created unfortunately india does not fall into that carve out so it's very very difficult for a indian fresh graduate to get through these these universities let's say if you're doing some non conventional course if you say that you want to specialize in advertisement law or if you want to specialize in sports law at harvard and at that time probably like five or six people have applied for that kind of specialization then they may consider you then they may consider your application but if you are applying for a general or a short after specialization let's say like international law or commercial law or financial law then the chances are very very grim all right so sir so would it be worth to pursue a full scholarship masters in a tier 2 or 3 law school or to opt to pursuing masters in india instead of course if you are getting a full scholarship from any of your tier 2 or tier 3 university you should definitely do that as opposed to doing your lm from india if that is an option of course and because it's going to be even if it does not really add any value as such but it will first of all it will it's going to be a good experience and you will be living abroad for a year you will be meeting different variety of people so lm from abroad is much more than just your degree it's about the exposure and the kind of experience that you have for that entire year you make new friends you meet variety of people you get to travel you get to experience different culture and that's what a broad education is quite frankly all about so you shouldn't really let go of that opportunity if that exists and you should really always choose any university if if it's a fairly okay university or a fairly okay or a, or a rather renowned university in your in india and no offense of course that does not cut up to the mark you just have a better life so that's that right so sir so, so uh, apart from us and uk can you suggest some other countries for corporate law of course australia is one so there are there university of melbourne there is university of sydney in australia very popular universities for indian students then there is asia for corporate law there is nus the top notch university of asia would be national university of singapore very well renowned corporate law specialization it's called as corporate and financial law there is university of hong kong in asia which is right below from rather close second to nus then if you talk about other countries in europe there is university of max planck which is in germany then uh there are this of course canada which is probably the third most or maybe the fourth most popular destination for indian students for pursuing their llm after uk us australia then there's canada and uh, what else then uh if you want to specialize in international law or international arbitration there's switzerland switzerland universities are very much there in offering very very advanced specialization in arbitration and international law and then of course there is similar courses that are being offered by french universities so there are multiple countries that you could explore and llm cost for those countries would also largely differ so an llm in germany can be very very cheap when you compare it with llm in uk you'll probably end up spending like 20 lakhs in total 
All right. And so, uh, how is the scene with Canada? It's it's similar. So you have a better shot of finding a job and settling down in Canada because finding a PR that is permanent residence is much more simpler. And the Canadian government actually wants immigrants to settle down in Canada because there's ample scope of employment there and it's not really saturated. So while of course you have to be employable and you have to show that you are genuinely like you are skillful. So you have to develop your skills and you have to perform well in the interviews. And the government would be happy to take you and you could really settle down in Canada. And the courses, University of Toronto is a very popular university for students who want to do their master's in Canada and they offer a business law concentration program, which is for two years. All right, so, so, so for the top tier law colleges, what kind of academic performances is expected if you could give us a particular percentage if possible? So, Oxford and Cambridge, if you check the website, it's very much there and they explicitly state that you have to be in the top 10% of your law school or top 10% of lawyers of your jurisdiction, which basically boils down to you being in the top 10% of your class. So, if there's a, if your batch has 180 students and you have to be at least in top 80, that's the expectation but typically they want you to be in top 10 or top 15 if your batch size is of course if let's say you are studying at general so the batch size, batch size is 30 so even if you're in top 15 or top 20 you still have a fair shot at these universities mm, got it sir so is it worth to pursue llm after completing ba llb with cs yes you can of course you can and when you come back or when you're applying for jobs either abroad or in India, then you can also leverage that CS degree and you say that not only do you understand law, you also understand compliances surrounding law and you bring out another perspective or you have an additional skill set. So, and law firms have started taking CS degrees or lawyers with CS degrees much more seriously than they used to five or 10 years ago. And now it's rather valued because now very few people do their LLB with CS. So if you're a fresh graduate and if you're doing your <coughs> LLB and if you are done with your CS or if you are in second stage, you should, I would recommend that you really finish it. And when you come back after your LLM or even if you don't decide to do your LLM, you can really use that qualification for your benefit, for your advantage. All right, so, so, so this is the last question that we'll be addressing. Uh, so okay. it, will it be a wise idea to do an extra LLM from India while gathering work experience by practicing before applying for foreign LLM? Yes, you can. I mean, if you think that you can afford it and if it's not going to cost you a lot of money, we can, you know, really, you can really do your LLM from India and then you're working. So let's say if you do, if you want to do, you can do your LLM from Mumbai University. That's not going to cost you any money and you don't really have to attend any classes and you can just do your LLM in two years and then while you work and then you apply for your master's. Got it. How many questions are left, Lippy? I would really recommend, rather I would prefer if we can finish up all the questions that came on as of 4.32. Yes, sir. So actually, it's while... Not a lot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Sir, so actually, while I mentioned that this is the last question, we received two questions post that. So we have addressed all the questions. So the, okay. uh, just these are left. So what are okay. some of the best law colleges to pursue LLM and IP? Okay, very specific question. It depends if you are okay with going to Asia, then NUS is the best university. It's the very solid IP uh, specialization so information and IPR and information technology. Yeah. Sir, but your voice is breaking. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, sir, it's better. Yeah. I was saying that uh, if somebody is interested in doing their LLM from Asia, then I think uh, NUS is a very solid IPR program. It's information technology and IPR. Then in UK, QMUL has a very solid IPR specialization. In Stanford, if somebody has some sort of two years of work ex, Stanford has a very good IPR related specialization. Then there's Melbourne, which is a very good IPR related specialization. Then NYU has a very good IPR related program. Then there is Columbia. Then there is uh, uh, which other university? 
so basically all the good universities except for harvard and cambridge i'm not really excluding them intensely but they don't really have specialization as such so you probably have one module that is being offered as part of ipr but the universities that i just named have a lot of modules to offer as far as ipr is concerned so you can like really specialize within a particular area in ipr so you could maybe specialize in trademarks or copyrights or maybe designs or patents you could decide your specialization and like of modules surrounding it all right so so the next question is what are the main skills you need to get settled in corporate law in abroad i'm not sure how to address this question you just basically when you apply to a corporate law firm it's a i would really recommend that whoever asked this question maybe check out couple of my videos that i took that i sort of i took a session on training contracts and vacation schemes in uk with law seco and other organizations if you just youtube it it will come out so it's a very elaborate process and it's a it's something that because when you are a fresh graduate you don't really apply for a associate position abroad you have to apply for something called as a training contract which is a two year training contract period and then once you get that training contract you start off as an associate so you should check out what the process is about and that would give you an idea about how to make an application and the kind of skills that you have to reflect in manifest when you are submitting that application all right sir um sir so this is the last question as of now uh, could you okay. talk a little bit more on certification in a foreign jurisdiction okay great great question uh actually so yeah I, i have been meaning to address this thing also always understand that like i was telling you that there are jurisdictional barriers with with a degree like legal with a degree like llb so you basically need to be qualified in that jurisdiction to practice law in that country i mean that is i'm, I'm very loosely making the statement but this is a short answer especially if you are a if you are a practicing lawyer and let's say you're working in india for a couple of years then you probably wouldn't want to apply to a training contract which is at the, which is where you start at the absolute bottom so if you want to move laterally all these law firms especially now the market is so bad that they want you to be qualified before you actually apply of course that is not the case everywhere and that is not the case for every law firm but typically even if you look at all the vacancies that come out they would probably want you to be qualified to practice law in either us or uk or maybe new zealand or australia these are the top four jurisdictions where you can be qualified but the most sought after qualification is either us or uk so for uk the qualification regime has changed a lot and from this year the uk government will be conducting the sra which is the bci equivalent will be conducting something called as a solicitors qualifying examination it's called as sqe so who shall ask this question should really read about that sqe is basically an examination it's conducted in two levels once you clear sqe you become a qualified lawyer in the uk and then you can find jobs either in uk or maybe elsewhere so once you are a qualified lawyer in uk or us it's very easy for you to penetrate the asian and middle eastern market so you can find you can fairly you can very easily find jobs in singapore or in dubai or in kuwait or basically in all these middle eastern countries and then once you have worked in couple of for a couple of years in let's say singapore or dubai then penetrating that london market is also very easy so maybe let's say you work with link letters or ll and overies singapore office for a couple of months couple of years and then you move to london or maybe then you can move out to us for that matter so then world becomes less i mean the world then becomes very fluid and very flexible if you have an additional qualification especially from either us or uk all right sir so we do not have any other questions sir so thank you for taking all the questions so patiently being a no law problem. student this webinar uh, was really helpful for me as well even i am interested to pursue llm let's see <laughs> where it goes yeah. but yeah this hmm. webinar was indeed helpful thank you so much sir um, thank you so thank you everyone good luck Yeah. Uh, I once again thank you, sir, for taking out some time for this webinar. As Lippy already mentioned, it was really helpful. Before we uh, finish off this session, I would just like to introduce introduce Memo Bandits as an institution. 
we are india's first mooting school for law students founded in 2014 by anant gupta and rachnendra tripathi we provide a unique platform that creates content and courses to bridge the learning gap between a classroom and a courtroom all these courses are curated by professionals from universities such as harvard columbia and nlsi and even law firms such as linklater hsf sam cam azb khetan and co etc so uh, these three and and the research paper writing course are our flagship courses starting with the first course which is an oral argumentation course in this course we specifically target the the art of uh, presenting oral arguments in front of the judge the moot court judge this is a very specialized course and with this course we have so many students who have performed extremely and exceptionally well in moot court competitions when they argue before the judge our next course is on memorial making in this we uh, specifically target as to how and in what ways one should research one should make the memorial i have myself taken this course and i and for a fact considering that i have done two moots two national moots myself i know how difficult it is to actually make a memorial and how lengthy of a process it is but with this course everything comes handy to you and the third course is something that i would say is not limited to law students but every every person who is in the field of law whether a law student or a lawyer should do this course because in this course we specifically teach all the citation methods that are used which can be helpful in writing research papers in making memorials or any other uh, any other article in which references are required all these courses are actually available uh, on discount by a flat 200 where you can simply use the web 200 coupon code and avail the same our next course is about research paper and it teaches you how do you actually master the art of writing a research paper being a law student uh i think the screen has frozen or the it it is not being shared right now but the the research paper writing course is a speci specific and specialized course in which law students as uh, it is a very common problem and even me as a lawyer uh, i face a lot of issues when i i uh, i have to write about something it it starts from the uh, idea that what i have to write about that is the choosing of your topic to towards the end of it when i have to get it proofread or uh, get it reviewed by someone else this entire process is quite lengthy and it is a, an, an an art which we at memo pandits are helping you to master the course is specifically designed for law students and it is very very interesting i have myself attended this course and the 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 process or the way in which it is taught is is i think amazing because the when you you doing this course you won't even realize that you're actually studying because the method the way of teaching the videos are so fun that you'd actually do it even when you know you don't feel like studying at all it has modules like you know appetizers and starters and and not the traditional uh, not the traditional way in which you actually study at law schools does uh with this i think we have come towards the end of this particular session and i would just request all the participants to fill the attendance form that has been circulated in the chat box and i uh, once again thank you pranjal sir for uh, for for sharing your valuable inputs and tips it was extremely helpful and it was a very good learning experience for all of us thank you thanks thanks happy to be here thank you